It was untypical of a Klan march. The crowd and the Klan did not meet. In fact, the two sides rarely got a glimpse of each other along the three-block parade route. The march scarcely took three minutes, and the rally on the city hall steps, another 10. A Mexican flag was shredded. The Mexican flag represents Mexico, which is becoming more and more anti-American. And uh, the Mexican government is allowing illegal aliens to flood our borders, which is uh, destroying our economy, taking away uh, jobs from Americans. And racist chants were shouted. But there was no violence, no arrest, and no injuries. In short, the Klan left San Antonio feeling cheated. So apparently this is just round one, and while the Klan admits that they did not win it, they promise they will be back for round two. They let us have our freedom of speech, but they take the people away that can listen to us. So it's the same end result. Are you going to plan any court action? Because we do plan court action, and we will be back in San Antonio over and over now. The people united will never be defeated. The people united. And while the crowd may have wanted to get at the Klan, police strategy kept them apart and Mayor Cisneros couldn't have been happier. They were not welcome here, and I believe it says a great deal that they had to come from elsewhere. The climate of civic harmony here does not make for homegrown movements of hatred. San Antonians today made that clear. We'll be back. We'll be back. Give us time. But city officials say the First Amendment only guarantees citizens the right to free speech, not the right to a violent crowd. And caught in the middle, the city must guarantee both sides protection. And any future Klan marches in San Antonio, say officials, will have to be considered through normal channels. Dave Walker, Newswatch 12. Officially, the president did not come to San Antonio as a candidate. It's only polite to compare Cinco de Mayo to the 4th of July and Benito Juarez to Abraham Lincoln. There are similarities. However, it is Mexican Independence Day, and Hispanics have become an important voting bloc. In government, you're shouldering an ever-increasing responsibility. I am proud that our administration has been able to appoint so far 130 Hispanics to high-level positions in our government. Still thousands more are out of work along the Texas-Mexico border, and the flood of illegals escaping a worse economy is not helping matters. This is not just your problem, it's our problem, and we'll meet it together. And today I'm pleased to announce that I will soon be appointing a special interagency working group to not only investigate, but to recommend specific actions to alleviate some of the hardship caused by economic uncertainty on the other side of the border. Though applauded enthusiastically, not everyone agreed with the president's economic views. He represents Bonzo on the other side of actor Ronald Reagan. <laughs> but the president was unaware of his critics, both in and outside of La Vellita. After mariachi music and a quick taste of San Antonio cuisine, the presidential visit was over. While President Reagan's message was directed toward Hispanics, the crowd here today was largely Anglo. Mr. Reagan said he was not campaigning, though. He was in San Antonio to enjoy Cinco de Mayo like everyone else. Dave Walker, Newswatch 12. The problem is with the project developer. Dave? Gene H. Frank Domingos, the president of Vanner Enterprises, has been given until August 3rd to come up with some $5 million necessary for him to complete the project at Vista Verde South Site. If he does not, then controlled data can pull out under the terms of this contract. The city has already sunk several million dollars into the project designed to revitalize the near west side and provide jobs at the same time. Officials have found themselves in the position of defending Vanner and Frank Dominguez several times in the past. But the council member who used to be Vanner's most staunch ally, Bernardo Ureste, says no more. Everybody's pointing fingers right now, but he has to produce. And uh, whether he gives us an assurance or not, there is a contract that we have with him. He needs to produce by August the 3rd. If he doesn't, then CDC is out, and we probably would have to restructure the entire Vista Verde South project if it could be restructured. And in discussion with the council this afternoon, the mayor says that Dominguez is solely responsible for permanently crippling the Vista Verde South project, in his words, to the point that it can never reach its full potential again. There is some sentiment that's been expressed that perhaps a new developer would help the project get back underway. Dave Walker, Live Cam 12, City Hall. Thank you, Dave.
I looked out the window, I thought it was thundering, and then I saw the sky was orange. That was the scene at one this morning. By 1.40, the fourth alarm was called in, bringing reinforcements to battle flames that leaped 300 feet into the air. Investigators say a fuel line in a pumping station ignited, threatening nearby storage tanks and a railroad tanker containing toxic gas. Neither were ignited, but one fireman told Newswatch, had the tanker gone, you could have kissed everyone in the area goodbye. HAL Corporation officials would give no comment, but one employee told Newswatch he was on duty at the time of the explosion. Heard a lot explosion. Turn us saw a lot of fire. Our first priority was shut our plant down and get some safety and help in here. We got the firefighting units out here. We only have five people out here. We don't know, I don't know the source of the fire. It's a very huge fire, possibly gasoline involved. One HAL employee was injured. 37-year-old Stanley Seiler is listed in serious condition at Brooks Medical Center with burns over the lower half of his body. And at least two firemen were overcome by fumes, but neither were hospitalized. A damage cost estimate has not been given, and investigators are still searching for the exact cause of the blaze. Dave Walker, Newswatch 12. Resolutions adopted following amendment. Senate Bill 1. The debate was not if it should pass, but how tough the proposed new drunk driving law should be on first-time offenders. Now, I thought we were trying to deal with the problem we are, beat up guys, and I thought we were trying to write a tough bill. We are, Senator. I thought we were trying to get a strong deterrent. Let me tell you, Senator, I don't believe that the fellow who goes in on the first offense and gets probated and gets lecture, I don't think he's likely to be deterred. The first offense can bring a fine of $100 to $2,000, three days to one year in jail, and a driver's license suspension up to one year. Not only do penalties become stiffer with each added offense, insurance companies can add a three-year surcharge to an offender's premium. Suspects who refuse to take breathalyzer tests can have their license suspended without prosecution. But even with heavier penalties, the Senate is still concerned it's not enough to curb drunk driving. We could pass a law requiring a death penalty for DWI, and if local prosecutors didn't get with it, we really wouldn't do that much good. Other DWI legislation, such as a bill that would ban open beer or liquor containers in automobiles, are still in committee, but could reach the Senate floor next week. With Senate approval today, stronger anti-drunk driving laws are now a matter of when more than if, because not only is there strong support in the House, but the governor is also ready to sign the bill into law. Dave Walker, Newswatch 12, Austin. City Hall reporter Dave Walker is in our newsroom with a report. And Dave, why has the council picked this particular adult theater to close? Well, Gene, the city claims that the theater owners are in violation of zoning codes which prohibit X-rated theaters in residential neighborhoods. It's not the first time the Olmos has been closed by the city. Six days ago, the theater was cited for the same violation and ordered shut down. Last night, Councilman Van Henry Archer drove by and was shocked to find it reopened. We have a city ordinance that prohibits the showing of X-rated movies when they're within 500 feet of a residential area. And these liars came down to the city and uh, claimed that they were going to show a general purpose, general family movie. After viewing the feature presentation, Blonde Ambition, a city inspector ordered it closed again. I issued him the notice to cease the operation immediately. Now, if they failed to do so, then my only alternative would be to file a case in court. Theater owners don't argue the point. In fact, they admit the violation. At the same time, they say the city's zoning code is unconstitutional, and they're ready to take the matter to the Supreme Court. Under this ordinance, as it applies in San Antonio, Texas, there is no place that we know of where an adult theater could be operated from that would not be within 500 feet of a residential area. Family-oriented second-run dollar movies used to play here, but the theater almost went under. Porn flicks attract a bigger and higher-paying audience. But when the case goes to court, the almost won't find any support from local residents. I don't think it's good for the neighborhood. I mean, I coach, you know, a uh, baseball team and little kids and stuff, and I don't, I don't think it's the kind of thing that we want in our neighborhood. I'm definitely against it. Yeah. Uh, it allows undesirables in the neighborhood. We try to raise a family down here, and you know, we, don't, we just don't like having it down here. Now, the Vice Squad has also checked out the Almost Theater. They say it was really soft porn, and for technical reasons, the film does not violate state law. So this is really going to be the city's fight. Gene? How do you judge a pig? 
And is all the hassle of showing it really worth a blue ribbon? Well, you get, let's see, you get a buckle, and then you get, get into the stale, and then uh, from there, you get a good bitter. I've got a couple of really good bitters that'll, that'll come in a bit of my hog. Uh, could get a couple hundred dollars for it. And what makes one turkey better than another? Who can really tell until it's cooked? And which of these little bunny rabbits is cuter than the other? Not even this panel of experts could decide. Winning is a matter of money for some of them, and losing, well, there really is no losing for these future farmers. The time and care they've invested in their livestock is a matter of pride. And of course, there are benefits when livestock shows come up. I do this because it's money making and it's fun, and you get to get out of school. When auction time comes around Saturday morning, some of these animals will bring anywhere from $100 to $1,000. But some of them won't be put on the auction block. You wouldn't want to sell a family member or anything. That one right over there is so gentle, it's like a little puppy dog. We can scratch her under the back leg, and, right, and, right, and she'll raise it up. Dave Walker, Newswatch 12.